when I try to teach someone something, whatever it is, I find there's gaps in what I know. And yeah. I have to go out and, and learn those gaps in order to express right. what I'm teaching to them. So what did you learn in this whole teaching process this is about caves and how did your like how did your course change over the years of teaching it? It became uh, it followed well, first of all the original curriculum largely remained intact all the way through but I learned different ways of teaching scallops I learned different ways of teaching uh, animal predation in caves. I learned different and more vivid ways of getting across these points. And secondly, I, I quickly uh, came to the final exam, which was to divide the class into two teams at one location in the cave and give them about an hour and a half or two hours to learn everything they could about that area of the cave. And so some of the teams would divide up, you look at the biology, I'll look at the geology, and we'll get together and compare notes. Well, what I was trying to teach them is that when you study something in a cave, you better have several people with you because the group is going to learn more than the individual will. And secondly, the group can discover more evidence than uh, an individual is likely to s discover. And secondly, uh, the group can get together and discuss what they've found. And they may disagree with each other. And so then there's a question of uh, exploring what evidence their individual conclusion is based on to come to a consensus conclusion. Well, my opinion is that science is done that way. It's done in groups. That technical writing is done by groups of people rather than individuals. Now, some people are better at it than others, but anytime you get a new set of eyes on things, you may get some information you hadn't considered before. So what I learned is that if you get the fundamental processes in a given field right, then you can refine uh, with your own experience uh, different ways to teach those uh, basic principles. And when you teach students to understand the basic principles enough so they could teach other people, they become pretty close to competent cave explorers and uh, if they if that process of taking questions to a cave catches on they're going to become uh, perhaps uh, cave scientists depending on how extensive their curiosity is I think people go into a science uh, because their curiosity leads them into it and as they learn more and more they they think of more and more questions and uh, they discover that some other people occasionally have the answers they're looking for they discover that maybe they can find out the answers by observation if not observation then maybe experimentation so all these are ways of, of investigating what is unknown and, and making it known, the teaching it to other people helps you refine or micro refine what it is you're doing and the understanding of the whole teaching process uh, helps you become a better teacher. You taught the course for a number of years yes. and during that time period there are more discoveries being made in Mammoth Cave and in the entire cave science field things were being reevaluated and 
did you find opportunity to incorporate new information and new discoveries into your teaching or were you on a, uh, to, to reflect these new things because I always found it personally exciting that something new was discovered even if it wasn't part of the, the basic <laughs> basic thing that I was studying of something new happened and that's cool that makes me more interested in learning the, 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 the basics. Yes, that occurred. Uh, let me give you an example. I had uh, <clears throat> taught a, a section one day on archaeology and I would take people into Salt's Cave where you find uh, this dried feces and uh, Read torch fragments and you find minerals that were mined. If you're lucky you may find pieces of gourd uh, which were used for bringing in water. Uh, you may find uh, nutshells which were food. And one, one time one of my students discovered some petroglyphs on a rock near a place where we were talking about how the floor dipped down and came up but the ceiling continued straight. I said this is the mark of an intersecting passage that uh, undermined uh, the floor and the floor collapsed and uh, so we know that and this other student came up and said hey I found some marks and we looked at it and, and underneath a rock uh, were petroglyphs which were smoked on the underside of the rock. There was a snake and uh, a grid, sort of looked like, like a hashtag, I don't know, and several other marks. And uh, well, that was the first petroglyphs we'd found in Mammoth in Salt's Cave. The following year, uh, I had, uh, oh well it turned out that archaeologists knew about these petroglyph forms from other caves. There was a turtle and a salamander and this mysterious grid that had been found in other caves in the area. Uh, so that was brand new to me and uh, well then the Park Service said uh, we're not uh, allowing you to go in Salt's Cave to teach the archaeology. And I protested. I said, you know, we're, we're very careful. We don't leave our initials and tear things up. I said, uh, they said, well, we're sorry, but you can't use Salt's Cave anymore. Well, drat. Uh, we'll go in Mammoth Cave, but that's going to be a big disappointment because Mammoth Cave has been collected and scrubbed and contaminated and I'll, I won't find anything. So I said, well, that's better than nothing, I guess. So I went in Mammoth Cave and suddenly I'm finding in the <laughs> Broadway, the main passage in Mammoth Cave, the same kind of stuff that we found in Salt's Cave. In other words, though years have gone by and collecting and so on and so on, there's still a ton of evidence of the same kind, dried feces, and uh, they're not as numerous, but there they are, they're, they're left over, and uh, read torch material and, uh, and so on. So I suddenly realized that while I had fashioned the course around certain specific locations where it's fairly easy to teach a principle that you can probably teach these principles almost anywhere and there may be more or less of what it is you're teaching but you can still find it. <laughs> uh, there's a, a principle like that, like I don't know what they call it, there's a name for it, like if you start looking for yellow cars, you simply see them everywhere when you never noticed them before. But I've experienced it personally. I was involved with a uh, native tree group and we're out measuring the heights of trees, see what heights these different species achieve. And the other people with me were like faster at it 
than I was. And so they're measuring all the heights of all these big tall trees all over the place. So I started looking at some of the medium sized ones. And I found some pretty good sized hawthorn trees, you know, which is normally shrub size. And some of these are like 30, 35 feet tall, which are pretty impressive. And they were just being ignored by everyone else because they were busy shooting the sycamores and, and all the other stuff. But after I started flying, I said, hey, these are big hawthorn trees for a little bush. Suddenly, everyone started seeing these smaller trees every place we went because it came into your consciousness that, that these things were there. And that's sort of what your exact same thing you're talking about. Uh, when you started looking for them in, in Mammoth Cave, you suddenly were able to see these features that you didn't, you'd probably walked by before but hadn't paid any attention to. Right. Well, these are the kinds of refinements that I got out of teaching for more than 20 years this subject. Uh, and I've taught hundreds of people, hundreds of cavers. Uh, these principles, uh, many of whom say to this day that it was taking Brucker's course that uh, really turned me on to caving. Uh, and Brucker was the best teacher I ever had for anything. Well, that is ego inflating if, if I ever heard anything that is. And while I think I'm a pretty good teacher, I'm certainly not pretty good teacher of everything and I can still learn uh, from amateurs, uh, professionals, uh, everybody. Um, and since I like to communicate, I, I like to tell people not just what I've found but how to find stuff and how to recognize it and how to double check your results, how to be skeptical about what it is you find, how to involve other people, uh, and all of the ways to get information. And then all of the ways to use information to help other people understand things. I'd say that process is, describes my teaching experience and how I've learned uh, to teach. Now, for example, if you talk to grade school teachers, a lot of them complain and bitch about how unruly students are, how they're not paying attention and, and misbehaving and so on. I have never in my years of combined subjects teaching had unruly students. Now, why is that? Did I select the students? No, I didn't have anything to do with selecting students. It's that, that I found out what they wanted to do. And if they didn't want to be in the course at all, I had to mainly entertain those people if I was going to have them stay. Uh, but I didn't really believe that they the only reason they were in a course is it was required. <laughs> uh, everybody can learn something. But it turns out that a lot of people, if you teach them how to discover things on their own, they find that magical. Now why is that? Is that built into the human psyche? I think it is. I think everybody is born with free will. The Bible is very clear on that. You can make decisions this way or that way. And even when you think you are confined, you can still make a decision about how you think about it, what your attitude is. Uh, the second thing is curiosity. I think everybody was born with a lot of curiosity. Some uh, children follow that curiosity to become distinguished scientists. Some children have that pretty well stamped out by adults around them. They, they're told curiosity killed the cat. You ask too many questions. Shut up and eat your oatmeal. Uh, things to tell them that being curious is wrong. And go watch television. <laughs> well, television is not necessarily all evil. You can learn a lot from television, but 
Also, you cannot learn to discover a lot by just watching television. The third thing is opportunities. We all have opportunities to, to exercise the curiosity and to exercise the free will. So everybody's born with that. Uh, armed with those three characteristics, some people take them to the absolute limits, way beyond other people's utilization of these three characteristics. Uh, some people learn to use some of those characteristics, and some of them uh, never learn very much because they're hampered by experience or lack of experience, and uh, never encountered anybody who said, let me show you how to discover things. <laughs> when you wrote your book about Stephen Bishop, yes, your historical fiction, tell me the story again about how you decided you're able to tell the story from the viewpoint of a black slave woman. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had, I had always been intrigued by Stephen Bishop and how one person could discover so much of Mammoth Cave. He, he probably found 25 miles of Mammoth Cave uh, beyond uh, the eight miles that were known at the time he arrived at the cave. <clears throat> In other words, he found more of Mammoth Cave than perhaps any other single individual. Now a lot of different people have found different parts of Mammoth Cave and yes it's 412 miles long but but necessary, how, how could this enslaved man who was ordered around by his owner uh, do all of this tremendous work? Because, as everybody knows, uh, black people are inferior uh, intellectually. Well, of course, Stephen Bishop was not intellectually inferior, and I don't know any black person who is intellectually inferior. There's some of them that know more than others, but black people are people, first of all, and maybe that's the main thing about them. They, they're, they're, they have free will, they're curious, and they have opportunities. So anyway, Stephen Bishop always interested me, and when I discovered that he married uh, Charlotte Brown, uh, that was another dimension of it, and when I discovered that they had a son, Thomas, uh, that was another dimension of this human being who started off as a sort of a caricature of a, a black man who was a, happened to be a cave explorer to becoming a full person with a family relationship and uh, a child and, uh, and so on. But all of the writing about Stephen Bishop is written by white people. And at one point in my <laughs> life, I was a school board member, and we uh, wanted to run a school that was uh, socially aware and would teach black students the same as we would teach white students. In other words, we were confronting our own racism in a school system, so we hired an expert who took us through a uh, series of meetings in which we were made to feel like a nigger. <laughs> Anything we said or did was wrong <laughs> and, uh, and suddenly understood the whole principle of white racism, that only white people can fix that. Black people cannot be more Uncle Tom, more uh, clever, more anything in a society where white people make the rules, enforce the rules, uh, maybe modify the rules, only white people can affect that society. 
So our school board was radicalized by this whole process. And that's when I began to see Stephen Bishop in a new light. Well, having written books about Mammoth Cave, nonfiction books, The Longest Cave, the, the book Trapped, the Caves Beyond, the uh, and uh, so on, it occurred to me I wanted to write about Stephen Bishop. And I had read about everything that had been written by him by white people. <laughs> but it seemed to me there was, uh, missing was the personality, the, uh, the non-caving life that was important. He was obviously a person with great curiosity. I knew that. He had a limited range of decisions he could make and probably some limited opportunities, but he seized more of the opportunities that he had than most people did and exercised the curiosity that he had more than most people did, white or black. So that's why I wanted to write about him. And. Uh, <clears throat> I started telling people that I wanted to write about him, and I was, uh, I wrote a chapter or two, and I showed it to Red Watson, and he said, this, this really is terrible. He said, you're trying to create black dialogue, and uh, about the only person who was able to pull that off was Mark Twain, and he didn't do it very well. <laughs> uh, so I began to doubt whether I could do this, and I, I talked to a friend of mine who's black, and uh, that's when I realized that I couldn't tell the story without some insights that I didn't have. So I located a woman who had contacted me and told me she was a playwright that she was a black person and lived in Louisville, Kentucky. And I said, well, I'm about to embark on a book about a, the Black Slave Guide of Mammoth Cave. So I met her and talked to her. And she was the person who said, well, you're, you're telling me that you want to write, you, a male, a white male, want to write a book about a, a black man. You've never been black. You've never been a slave. And you've never been a woman. I said, you'd be lucky to get any one of those right. <laughs> and I was struck dumb by that realization that she really understood the problem I faced, which was how to, how to frame a book about Stephen Bishop, since I was not black, not a woman, not a slave. Well, Every time I had a speleology class, I would ask all the students what it is they wanted to do. And one, one of the students said, I am an accomplished author. I have several books published, and I want to write a thriller book about discovering the longest cave. So I said, well, that's, a, that's going to be interesting. Uh, can I, have you written anything I can read? So he sent me a book called The Purification Ceremony, which is about a, a Native American woman bow hunter who solves a murder mystery. And I said, oh, he's written, he's captured a woman's point of view and a Native American's point of view, it seems to me, in this book. And he's not either of those. So I said, how did you decide you could write a book from those two viewpoints? He said, well, I asked a friend of mine, and she said, uh, well, you just write it as best you can and then show it to somebody who doesn't love you. <laughs> she said, if you show it to a woman who doesn't love you, I shall like it because she likes you. <laughs> Uh, so that's not going to help you at all. So that's when I explained that to
for Ritter Jones, who is the black prairie playwright in Louisville. She said, well, that was pretty good advice you got. Uh, so then I said, well, would you be willing to read what I write and give me your frank uh, criticism of it? So I began to write the story and, and shipped her chapters as I wrote them. Well, she said, you, you've pretty well got it right up to the point where you have the one of the black slaves talking back to the master at uh, Three Forks at the inn there. Uh, the cook uh, tells the master that she's not going to make another batch of biscuits. He ate up the last batch and uh, at the price of biscuits, <laughs> price of ingredients to make biscuits, it wouldn't pay off, and he, she was not going to light the fire and start over to make more biscuits for his meal. I said to her, but the cook knew that the her owner was a tightwad. He was uh, had an obsession about money. <laughs> he didn't want to spend a dime he didn't have to spend, and she understood that, and uh, so it wasn't a matter of talking back angrily to the boss, it was a matter of appealing to the boss's obsession about not spending money. <laughs> she said, well, I think that's exactly right. And then she said, black people understand this kind of what you can get away with uh, very sensitively. They, they, are, they live life. Uh, knowing, uh, learning what they can get away with and what they can't get away with. And uh, as an example, you hear people talk about uh, uh, Floyd being uh, murdered by the police kneeling on his neck. And I've heard several black people describing this, that, that black people cannot drive a car anywhere without feeling that they may be murdered by some policeman that's going to stop them for uh, a missing taillight or something. So they have an unbelievable amount of dread when they see the red light, or the now blue lights going on behind them, that they may not survive this. It's, it's something that white people may fear, but they don't experience the kind of deathly fear that black people experience because it's widely known that you can end up dead if the cop doesn't like you <laughs> uh, for any reason. And indeed, white racism works that way. There right-wing racists will hate all black people treat them badly, and so on. Liberal racists will <laughs> patronize black people, uh, play along with them, uh, and black teach white teachers who deal with black students patronize the black students, and they don't work, don't do the homework. They assume, well, oh, that's the background of coming from a family with no books and no magazines and, and no uh, regard for education in the first place. So I can either make a stink about it and end up in huge racial trouble, or I can just let it slide. Well, so white people let it slide. They never deal with their own racism. They just feel sorry for black people. <laughs> without understanding the problem at all. So racism penetrates all of white society. From the right wing, I'm going to murder the black sons of bitches, and they're not human, all the way to, oh, those poor people. Uh, how do you expect them to behave any other way than way below your expectations? <laughs> so anyway, I, I had already gone through that, so I understood it pretty well. So. I'm equipped to write the book. Well, people are 
the product of everything they've had in their experience up to the point they have an experience. So I have had the experience of discovering things in caves. So I think my experience is probably comparable to the kind of aha moments that Stephen Bishop had. Uh, he was a human being, as I am a human being, and yes, uh, being black is not the same as being white, but on the other hand, the curiosity may be the same. So that's the premise on which I began to write that book. It was Red Watson who said, you're not going to get away with this black dialect. And indeed, I discovered, I, I finally realized that the black dialect was my white racism trying to imitate what I perceived to be black dialect. <laughs> Wrong. So I then did some writing in several different ways, but I found that if I wrote in a straightforward subject, verb, subject, verb, uh, not too many analogies and similes and metaphors and so on, uh, I could write short sentences which came out to convey meaning to people. Uh, who never said when no black person would talk the way you talk in the book. Uh, on the other hand, I used very little black dialect. The only place I used it was when Charlotte Brown, the chambermaid at, uh, at Three Forks Inn, uh, was being uh, <coughs> attacked by her boss she leaned out the window and yelled in black dialect uh, uh, to a white person that she was being uh, pursued and uh, she needed help. And she, of course, addressed the guy when she had a chamber pot full of shit and pee that she was uh, so glad that she was employed by him, she began to dance around with this pot in a way and accidentally spilled the pot of shit on the boss, who of course <laughs> had to clean up right away and get the hell out of the room. So he was not able to uh, rape her, which was his intent, because of her behavior in, in yelling loudly in a, in a black dialect. So that was the only place I've used black dialect in a place of desperation on her part. So anyway, Corridor Jones was uh, decided finally that I, I could write this book and uh, that the uh, characters seemed to her to be authentic. Uh, beyond the uh, question of when you when we would disagree with the master. Well, you'd only disagree with the master who you understood pretty well. <laughs> so anyway, that's the story of my writing that book. Yeah, I had questions about how to deal with black dialect when I was working on my Black Guys project because there was a uh, Union soldier who talked to Matt Bransford yeah. and he recounts of what Matt talking to him about the loss of his children yes. and he portrayed it in uh, in a kind of a dialect yeah. and uh, when I had Stephen Barnes who's a black man be the host for the video and uh, he was doing different voices on his own. He decided to do it, and it's what to deal with the uh, black dialect in, in that section. And he says, "Well, he didn't have any problem doing it as it was written, although that probably wasn't how <laughs> yeah. Matt, Matt had spoken. But he didn't have any problem with it because that's." what the historical context says. Yes. 
the, but the, the dialect was written by a white man yeah. and his memory of what he heard. And he was not a practiced uh, dialectician who could uh, have vast knowledge of how black people talk and think uh, that he just tried to imitate that. So I think my understanding of racism is, uh, was a huge benefit to being able to write a book like that to my satisfaction because I knew if it wasn't authentic I would be uh, roundly chastised by all kinds of people. Uh, particularly black people who would recognize that uh, this is a white man writing uh, his version of black thought. Well, I made Stephen Bishop and I created Stephen Bishop to be a very curious, a very competent, a very uh, human being, I think. Uh, nevertheless, one who was able to interact with white people because he interacted with a lot of white people. 